All right, so uh, kind of piggybacking off where we left off there, let, let's kind of dig into you know training and diet philosophies now. Um, obviously, you work for probably the most well-known nutrition company uh, in online fitness, uh, as far as I know. You know, uh, so so what what kind of what will go nutrition first? Uh, how how is uh, Renaissance periodization? and their meal planning, their diet planning, what, what differentiates them from some of these other, you know, cookie cutter uh, type meal plans and services? Well, the big thing with the way we set up our nutrition plans is it's long-term sustainable. Uh, we do have you know, meal frequency. If you can adjust the lifestyle just to eating maybe smaller meals every so often, you know, just every few hours, it really goes a long way in the long run as far as accumulating better metab overall metabolism and keeping that up, basically keeping your engine running well. Um, but the big thing to me is we can plan things out as far as our cut phases or any potential gaining phases, and especially our maintenance phases to be at the right times to where when you make your progress, that part's easy. Everybody can make progress. You can start a crash diet and make progress. Right. But how you manage that afterwards is really the key to long-term success. So our maintenance plans after a cut phase or something like that normally is what's gonna help make those changes more permanent and kind of give you that physiological reset of, okay, this is where my body is now. I'm gonna maintain this. And we're also at the same time creating a sensitivity when we manage the maintenance phase right to either being able to go into a gaining phase to gain more muscle and increase your metabolism because of that. Great lesson to learn. <laughs> The bigger your car engine is, aka muscle, the more fuel you're going to have to consume to keep it up. So no replacement for displacement. Exactly. <laughs> um, but we create sensitivities in each phase to lead into the other one. It's a concept called potentiation. We're creating the potential for a change to be made later to cause a an intended impact that we actually have a system for that goes. It can go throughout your entire life. So as long as you have specific plan phases that lead into the next, and the same thing goes for training. We'll talk about that in a little bit, I'm sure. But you have a plan sensitivity, but you're getting the most out of the stimulus that you're creating at the time. Leading into the next one, that's how you avoid plateaus. So we're always changing things at the right amount of time based on the research. And basically you don't have to worry about stalling out. And, and now how has, uh this changed for you like what was your nutrition like before renaissance periodization um <laughs> if <laughs> what philosophies were there if any um i know a lot of us power lifters aren't known for our meticulous diets um but but is there anything there that you can speak on personally that maybe you thought was one thing before or something that you were pretty vehement about about with your dieting that maybe a, your eyes have opened up otherwise since uh you know, joining in with Renaissance periodization and all the research that goes into that. Well, the first diet advice I ever got was actually from Hannah Johnson. I believe she's still with EFS online. Um, <laughs> it was the first time I'd ever inquired about food aside from, you just need to eat more so you gain weight. So I started right. off slow and small. So, <laughs> uh, but I laid out what I'd been eating and the first, the only reply she really had was, Chef Boyardee is not your friend. <laughs> she was probably right. Yeah, she was totally right for uh, the sake of my body composition and for my digestive tract. <laughs> I'll tell you that cold spaghetti and meatballs out of the can is one of my comfort foods. It's not something I, I indulge in a lot anymore, but every now and then it, it just it hits right. So, yeah, can continue. It hits right is a very relative <laughs> term. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hits. Yeah, it hits. Regardless. Um, but really making sure I had the total macros in, your protein, carbs, and fats. Overall, that, you know, getting that set based on some of the recommendations from the research really helped a ton, but the nutrient timing. When you're an elite athlete or trying to get to that point, all those little things really add up a lot. And I know on our chart with RP, we talked about nutrition timing being about 10% of the total, you know, part of your success. But for some people, it's actually a lot more. Right. If they're hanging around, you know, they've been around the right macros for a long time, eating naturally, just you know, eating when they get hungry and whatever.
whatever they want, nutrition timing can actually cause a really big increase in your metabolism, purely based on the clients that I've worked with. Um, but you can get better nitrogen levels and amino acid availability for continuous cycling of recovery and uh, anabolic adaptations from training. Your energy is better because it's smoother instead of, you know, you eat a ton like an intermittent fasting type deal. You, <laughs> you, you have a really big uptake of nutrients and then, then you have that period of time where you're not taking anything in. If you don't have the amino acids in your bloodstream or in your digestive tract, the recovery is not actually going to happen regardless of how many hormones are triggered from the, the fasting part. But it's also easier to stick to. So that's the really big appeal of intermittent fasting. And just FYI, like I don't buy into the, the magic, mystical parts of intermittent <laughs> fasting. For me, it's just adherence. It, like Derek said, it's, it's easy to adhere to. Yep. Um, going to bed after eating 1,500 calories... Uh, in one sitting is much nicer than being hungry and going to bed. So, and, and that is the number one variable in all diet plans: adherence. That's right. You, you can't you can't fix that one if you, <laughs> you can't do anything else with your diet plan if you don't have adherence first. Right. So that's priority number one. And I don't blame you at all if that works for you. Right. Um, but the nutrient timing for me helped me sustain recovery all the way throughout the day. I mean, things you know, if you have specific foods. Like whey protein digests quickly. Everybody knows that. Right. 30 minutes or so. So you have that around workout time. And we look out the entire 24 hours throughout the day. So if we have a lean protein source that normally digests between four to five hours, sometimes you know three hours, depending on what it is, if we have that every three, four, five hours, then you've always got available amino acids in your digestive tract and bloodstream, and you have the building blocks to be able to recover. At nighttime, I have a casein protein shake. And that takes around six hours to digest. If we add a little bit of fats, it'll take a little bit longer. So if you sleep for eight hours out of the entire 24-hour cycle, you only didn't have protein in your system for about an hour. So those building blocks are always there, and it helps you recover a little bit quicker. Right. So that, that really helped me a ton as far as being able to sustain the training and the performance for several years, particularly at the end of my career. So right. And that longevity, you know, you, you can't buy time. That's the one thing yeah. we can't make more of. You can't go back and buy. You can't train to have more of. Uh, you, you can train to extend it uh, and perform as good as you possibly can for longer, but time's something we never get. So uh, let, let's kind of segue that into training. Um, how did you start off training again early philosophies, methodologies, if any, versus, you know, what your training, let's say, looked like at the end of your powerlifting career and then on to, you know, how you're training now in conjunction with your jiu-jitsu. Well, when I started um, really organized weight training, because I did some stuff before I got to high school and before training for football and stuff like that. I had a home gym machine that came from Walmart. My dad was great to buy me. When That's I was awesome. In sixth grade, and I pounded away at that thing as much as I could, and as much as I knew how. Right. Um, but I was really lucky in high school. I had a great strength coach. He was a former powerlifter, so he was bringing a large wisdom base, and he had a lot of good knowledge as well. And we had to squat to depth. Um, the bench presses touched our chest. We did some uh, Olympic weightlifting movements, mainly hand cleans. We didn't do them from the floor, and we didn't deadlift. I didn't do a deadlift until I think it was my junior year of high school when I saw another teacher was actually a wrestling, wrestling coach, Josh Winch, and he was pulling sumo. I was like, what in the world? <laughs> yeah. what is That's this? a funny looking squat. What, what is this voodoo? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he showed me how to do that. And of course, I pulled sumo throughout my entire career. So props out to Coach Williamson. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we, we had a good base with that. Things were planned out pretty well. It was more of a linear periodization style training base like we talked about. Um, Me and Derek will elaborate on that later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I just said that. Video, <laughs> I've got it on video. That there was a linear ascent <laughs> in intensity. There were, I don't know if there were any periods in that training <laughs> philosophy. But it was more of a linear progression. Oh. Uh, but... We had a good base with that. He taught us a good technique, and that really carried over into my post-high school lifting career in college. And I only had to adjust a few things to be able to really get into powerlifting. Believe it or not, in high school, I wasn't squatting, you know, eight feet wide, being five foot six or seven. 
the world with a thousand pounds on my back, I'm like five two. <laughs> so, but uh, with you know getting my toes out to the end of the mono, I, I squatted a little bit outside shoulder width. But I was able to get my knees out well because I was researching powerlifting already. So I was starting to understand you know the wisdom of other people and how they were positioning their bodies. I didn't know why it worked yet, but I right. knew that it started working. So um, I was able to take those little lessons and just build on them. And as the education got better, I started understanding the mechanics. And with all my clients, I had them send, uh, all my combo clients or training only clients, they send me videos of their training and I will analyze them biomechanically. Uh, Dr. Kimi Sato at ETSU is you know, he's a world-renowned biomechanist. He does movement assessments for all kinds of different sports, and we actually work with golf most of the time. But the lessons that I learned from him and general you know, kinesiology and biomechanics classes in general, it, it completely changed how I saw lifts. And I can see inefficiencies. Like, you see somebody hit the bottom of the squat and their knees come in a little bit. Well, I know that's normally adductor magnus because it's tight. It works as a hip extensor, and it also works for hip adduction like that. So if that muscle is tight, when it engages, it's going to pull the knee in a little bit. So if I see that, I don't know, we need to work on that specifically. So we'll start doing side lunges or good girl, bad girl machines with specific stretching times and ways to basically hit all those specific muscles that I can see causing shifts in the lifting technique. And when you look at my lifts later in my career, I was able to hold positions and you never really saw me miss a lift where my knees would shoot in or something would break down, I would just go down, hit the bottom here up, and then go, shit, it's heavy. <laughs> <laughs> so it, there wasn't an abrupt you know, imbalancing where it was stopping me. It was just the weights were hard. Right. <laughs> now, now let's let's talk here a little bit. You were a multi-ply lifter. Mm -hmm. um, I did do one raw with wraps and meat, but it was before raw with wraps was a thing. Gotcha. <laughs> Uh, and, and that what I was gonna allude to the timetable of when you you competed. Um, did you ever train you know West Side Conjugate? Absolutely. During its heyday. Oh yeah. And, and any general thoughts uh, you know for them out there on you know the West Side method itself? Um, well, the West Side method is if you read the articles, all the articles that Louis put out and all the quotes that Louis put out, and I talked to Louis. I did his meets for God, how many years? over half a decade. So the method is very adjustable, we can say, because um, he has dynamic effort method, max effort method. Uh, then he has a repetition effort method, however he worded that one. So you have lightweights that move fast, heavyweights that you know are really hard, and then you have doing reps. So if you don't make progress on the West Side methodology, it's not because of the methodology, it's because you didn't put the right effort method, you know, conjugation on the verb in, that, <laughs> in the right place. So there's always a way to make the gains because if you have those three things, you have all the, rep the ingredients for a recipe to make a training program regardless of what it's called. Right. So if you lift west side, you lift heavy and often... And you manage your, that sounds really familiar with every other training program in the world. Uh, the bands and chains make it look a lot more exotic, and I mess with those constantly. But believe it or not, the, uh, the hardest time to make progress at the end of your career, when you're already you know, kind of at that peak, I used reverse bands two weeks out of a six-month cycle. And that was just for an eccentric overload or an attempt to do that. Right. So... You really don't necessarily need that stuff if you plan everything out well. There are benefits to bands, in my opinion, because with a little bit of band tension, and if you're going to lift an explosive weight or a lightweight explosively, if you go up without any band tension, just with straight weight on the barbell, with the same speed that you could jump, you're going to be inhibited because you don't want to leave the ground with a load on your back and right. have to crash back down to earth with it. If you have bands there, they accommodate all the force that you're generating and the, the inertia or momentum, and you can lift as fast as you want and with enough band tension, it'll stop it. You won't take flight, but you're still lifting at that same rate. Right. So I think that's a really big benefit of bands in general. And a lot of the adaptations that Louis talks about could be from that effect itself. It's not necessarily because you're fighting the bands. It's because it allows you to not be inhibited by that 
thought of, I'm going to take flight and have to catch all this stuff, <laughs> which to me makes a little bit more sense. Uh, certainly, certainly. Yeah. Um, it, is that, are, are there any, other than the lifting heavy and lifting often, like <laughs> uh, any, any specificities from, uh, not west side specifically, but uh, conjugate that you now translate to your clients and or your current training? For sure. The, um, the actual conjugated method, it's not West Side. West right. Side, you know, a lot of that came from the Soviet research. And Dr. Stone was actually doing very similar research here in America. At the same time, Yuri Verkashansky was doing the research funded by Soviet Russia. Believe it or not, Verkashansky didn't speak much English. Doc definitely didn't speak any Russian. <laughs> All the research articles that were published at that time were in Russian or English. They couldn't read each other's work, but they were doing the same thing in a double-blind setting. And they started finding the same things as far as training studies. And they came up with having heavy days and then light days that basically repeated the same thing you did earlier at a lower percentage. Right. So that helped manage fatigue. And you can also increase your power development because you're lifting a lighter weight. So you have those two things put together, you have stronger and more explosive athletes. With another concept of that, when you're doing the same exercises and the same rep scheme from one day to the next, we really focus on getting the adaptations out of, say, doing sets of 10. So we have heavy day, light day, fatigue's managed, but you're doing the same four or five exercises, sometimes just three. In my case, a lot of times just two because that's all I could recover from. Right. Believe it or not, I wasn't going to go do a million lunges and good mornings after a squat of a thousand pounds. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, when you have that, what we call a concentrated load, it's building sensitivity to other exercises in the next block. So we're doing this, we get, the, we get the maximum adaptation from what we're doing at the time. And then we're also sensitive to what we're going to introduce in the next block, which might be a different rep scheme completely or just different exercises. But when you concentrate that load, you're potentiating the success of the next phase. And that's the same thing we talked about with nutrition is potentiating everything and you create that constant cycle where you never actually plateau. Right. And the conjugated method, as far as having heavy and light days, really helps with that a lot. Long-term sustainability. Long-term sustainability. Um, something cliche about a marathon and a sprint um, mm -hmm. with your training there. Um, and, and to kind of wrap this segment up, what, what is your training like now, um, now that you're doing jujitsu? Um, and I often see your posts on Instagram mm -hmm. saying, Hey, I'm squatting this, um, uh, then going to go roll on the mats tonight. Uh, are, are you training to aid your jujitsu now? And if so, kind of how, how is that different than just training for all out power on the platform? Well, when you're training for a sport. When you're in the weight room, you're no longer training your sport. You're trying right. to enhance the sport. So, again, bringing all those concepts and cutting out all the BS so you can get stronger and better conditioned for the sport that you're going to be doing with a certain level of specificity and making sure that you don't accumulate too much fatigue in the weight room to where it hinders your performance in practice, whether regardless of the sport that you're doing, because uh, that's always going to be priority. So I only do two, maybe three exercises now in training, even though I'm not you know, squatting things with commas in them anymore. <laughs> um, but I need to make sure that my fatigue isn't too high or lasting too long. If you know, I've got soreness for two or three days, my jujitsu is going to suck and my muscles are going to be tight. I can't hit the positions. And when you're fatigued, your brain doesn't quite work the same way. Those neural impulses are a little bit slower and fewer, you know, more time in between them. So the motor skills you develop as far as you know, technique and, and things like that, they're not as good. So if you're fresh and you learn a technique, it's gonna be a higher level of adaptation. Right. So I, I had to cut back on that, stick to the basics, do what I know works. And right now I'm doing 30 seconds rest on five by fives. So I'm trying to work on my ability to clear lactate out of the muscles, just you know, shorter rest periods, you recover quicker. And in jujitsu, a lot of times, unless you're a super high level no gi competitor where you just you know basically look like two cats <laughs> all the time. Uh, especially in a gi you're going to have explosive movements and then you're going to grab a hold and you're going to sit there for a minute and wait for the other person to move it's a big chess match so explosive movement short rest explosive movement you know you can see how right right 
you're, you're going to absolutely break the internet with, you know, uh, co-signing both conjugate and bands and also five <laughs> by five in the same conversation. Uh, th those two don't work together in YouTube comment sections. That, that's perfectly <laughs> fine. But, you know, having, that's one of those things where we talk about having wisdom and knowledge. If, right. you, if you have the knowledge to understand the, you know, the gears and the, the compounds that are moving in the background of everything that you see, the physiology of what's going on with the adaptations and the stimulation from the training, you can have your wisdom over here is like, well, I've seen these things work. I know how this works. Maybe if I change these couple of things and add this here, you kind of bridge that, that gap between wisdom and knowledge. You know, the bro science and then the research, you put it together and you have something that works a lot more efficiently and you can actually keep yourself from getting injured as much when you do that. And let's sort of wrap this segment up with uh, how big of a role does your physical strength play in your jujitsu? You know, when I first started, I really thought I would be able to go in and probably beat most of the people at my own level in the white belt level. Uh, maybe at a blue belt or something, just from being strong. Right. But as I learned more about jujitsu from the, the Gracie family, I, f I forget the guy's first name. It was Hickson and Hoyce's father, grandfather. Or yeah. Maybe, yeah. I'm not an expert on the language. <laughs> I just got started this year. So uh, the smallest sibling of the entire family ended up being the best jujitsu practitioner because he fit the methods into giving the advantage to the smaller person by creating leverage. So now I go into jujitsu. It's almost been a year, 10, 10, 11 months now. And I'm still getting beat by people that I outweigh by 80 pounds. <laughs> Who, you know, a lot of them haven't even been in the weight room in the last year or so. Right. So it's extremely humbling, but I see it as a big chess match. And there are a lot of parallels between no gi jujitsu and raw powerlifting. And then using a gi in jiu-jitsu and a quick powerlifting because the variables are added exponentially. There are grips and all kinds of you know extra techniques that right. are actually seen as traditional compared to no gi because gi was always used in the martial arts. So it's it's been a pretty wild ride in general. Do you prefer one over the other? Do you train both? No gi is a lot easier. I, I would just, imagine so. Just like raw powerlifting. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, because it's just a lot simpler. Uh, people can come in with wrestling backgrounds and then dominate. Oh, them. yeah, for sure. There's, for sure. There's, uh, I forget the guy's name now, but there's a blue belt who is going to world championship level competitions, ADCCs, who had, was a really good wrestler. He picked up a few submissions, and he's wrestling with black belts and no gi. If you put him in a gi, he's probably going to get dominated because they know how to manipulate right. all the variables with the gi. But I, I enjoy the different levels of the gi because it takes a lot of uh, really the wisdom to know how to work things and gain leverage and, right. and, and whatnot. But the no is a lot faster. I can use my strength a lot more. That makes sense. Yeah. And I'm not stapled down to the ground by somebody way smaller than right. me feeling like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Just FYI, guys, uh, you know, I've seen the debate a lot about, you know, gi being, or no gi being more practical than gi uh, for public self-defense. But when you're out and about, this dude's got a jacket and stuff on. Mm -hmm. Like That's exactly it. That's a gi, basically, you know, when you're out in public. So, uh, so we'll kind of wrap up this segment here. <laughs>